The history of Protestantism, which we propose to write, is no mere history of dogmas. The teachings of Christ are the seeds. The modern Christendom, with its new life, is the godly tree which has sprung from them. We shall speak of the seed and then of the tree, so small at its beginning, but destined one day to cover the earth. How that seed was deposited in the soil, how the tree grew up and flourished despite the furious tempests that warred around it, how century after century it lifted its top higher in heaven and spread its burrows wider around, sheltering liberty, nursing letters, fostering art, and gathering a fraternity of prosperous and powerful nations around it. It will be our business in the following pages to show. Meanwhile, we wish it to be noted that this is what we understand by the Protestantism on the history of which we are now entering. Viewed thus and any narrower view would be untrue alike to philosophy and to fact. The history of Protestantism is the record of one of the greatest dramas of all time. It is true, no doubt, that Protestantism, strictly viewed, is simply a principle. It is not a policy. It is not an empire having its fleets and armies, its officers and tribunals, wherewith to extend its dominion and make its authority obeyed. It is not even a church with its hierarchies and synods and edicts. It is simply a principle but it is the greatest of all principles. It is a creative power. Its plastic influence is all-embracing. It penetrates into the heart and renews the individual. It goes down to the depths and, by its omnipotent but noiseless energy, vivifies and regenerates society. It thus becomes the creator of all that is true and lovely and great, the founder of free kingdoms and the mother of pure churches. The globe itself it claims as a stage not too wide for the manifestation of its beneficent action and the whole dominion of terrestrial affairs it deems a sphere not too vast to fill with its spirit and rule by its law. Whence came this principle? The name Protestantism is very recent. The thing itself is very ancient. The term Protestantism is scarcely older than 500 years. It dates from the protest which the Lutheran princes gave in the Diet of Spires in 1529. Hello and welcome everyone. Thanks for coming to join us today on our gathering here, Sabbath day on the 6th of January, 2024. This is the first session in the year 2024 for the reading of, reading and discussion of the history of Protest Protestantism. And today, uh, Michael and I are joined by a special guest, Hector from Utah. Welcome, Hector. Thanks for the for the invitation. I'm so honored to be with you, my brothers. Thanks, Michael, for uh, giving that idea. <laughs> and thanks to you, Brett. Absolutely, thanks, it's God, for... it's a pleasure to be here for for everyone in the. Uh, in the world wide web yes because you know i mean who made the web i mean what's the purpose of the web anyway i mean we could sit all day and talk about that but you know why not use it for the purpose of the gospel and uh let's think about our protestant uh heritage here for a moment you know 
think about all of the people that gave their lives because they knew that we would be put to the test in this life, and this life isn't what it seems to be. Because seriously, you can live for pleasure, you can live for your belly, but at the end of the day, what does it do for you? It serves your flesh, it doesn't serve your spirit. And we're here to think about the flesh for change, or the spirit <laughs> as opposed to the flesh for change, right? So, yeah, quite a history that we have. Um, and of course, a lot of uh, uh, religious um, teachings get in the way of the historical teaching. And uh, I think it's really important to go back to the historical roots and study those roots because it's from those roots that everything sprang. I mean, we got to go back in our heritage to, to see that Rome hasn't changed. The world may have changed somewhat in some regards. Technology may have changed, but the roles and the purpose still remains the same, and the prophecy of old times seems to be ticking away. And yes, uh, today we're in the history of Protestantism, and we're going to go into the Waldenses and their valleys, chapter 6. And last time when we were in chapter 6, we made it all the way to the Noble Lycon, and that was a really interesting little tidbit. So I'm going to start at the beginning of this, uh, excuse me, paragraph. And Michael or Hector, if you have anything to say, please interrupt me and let's hear what you got. Because uh, I think, you know, there are a lot of things that the Waldenses, well, they're being a true witness of the gospel through some of the roughest times in history and the dark ages and uh, those two churches from what I understand you have a eastern and a western leg of this this uh, this these witnesses that are living through some of the hardest years in the Roman era so that's why it's so important to Remember that, oh, these are historical witnesses. They're not one person. This is not one person. It's more or less one church, one flock of believers. From one from the eastern side of the world, which is really tough probably for most of us West Westerners to <laughs> wrap our brains around. But we have the western side, and that is the Waldenses. So here we go. Behind this rampart of mountains, which providence foreseeing the approach of evil days would almost seem to have reared on purpose, did the remnant of the early apostolic church of Italy kindle their lamp, and here did that lamp continue to burn all through the long night which descended on Christendom. There is a singular concurrence of of evidence in favor of their high iniquity, uh, antiquity, excuse me. Their traditions invariably point to an unbroken descent from the earliest times as regards their re religious belief. The noble Lycon, which dates from the year 1100, goes to prove that the Waldenses of Piedmont did not owe their rise to Peter Waldo of Lyons who did not appear till the latter half of that century in 1160. The noble Lycon, though a poem, is in reality a confession of faith and could have been composed only after some considerable study of the system of Christianity in contradistinction to the errors of Rome. How could a church have arisen with such a document in their hands, or in her hands? Yeah, because they're speaking of a church. The female is considered, in the Bible, uh, when you're speaking of her, is considered a religious institution. 
just like the true gospel is also considered a woman because you have there's two different women right you have the righteous woman and then you have the disobedient woman and they're two completely opposed to one another right like christ and antichrist okay or how could these herdsmen and vine dressers shut up in their mountains have detected the errors against which they bore testimony and found their way to the truths of which they made open profession in times of darkness like these? If we grant that their religious beliefs were the heritage of former ages handed down from an evangelical ancestry, all is plain. But if we maintain that they were the discovery of the men of those days, we assert what approaches most almost a miracle. Their greatest enemies, Cloud Cestral, excuse me, Cloud Cecil of Turin, fifteen seventeen, and Renerius, uh, the Inquisitor, twelve fifty, have re- admitted their iniquity and stigmatized them as, quote, the most dangerous of all heretics because the most ancient, unquote. Rorinco, prior of St. Roche, Turin, 1640, was employed to investigate the origin and antiquity of the Waldenses and, of course, had access to all the Waldensian documents in the ducal archives, and being their bitter enemy, he may be presumed to have made his report not more favorable than he could help. Yet he states that, quote, they were not a new sect in the ninth and 10th centuries, and that Claude of Turin must have detached them from the church in the ninth century, unquote. Within the limits of her own land, did God provide a dwelling for this venerable church? Let us bestow a glance upon the religion, or the region, excuse me. Let me start that again. Within the limits of her own land, did God provide a dwelling for this venerable church? Let us bestow a glance upon the region. As one comes from the south across the level plain of Piedmont, while yet nearly a hundred miles off, he sees the Alps rise before him, stretching like a great wall along the horizon. From the gates of the morning to those of the setting sun, the mountains run on a line of towering magnificence. Pastures and chestnut forests clothe their base. Eternal snows crown their summits. How varied are their forms. Some rise strong and massy as castles. Others shoot up tall and tapering like needles. While others again run along in serrated lines, their summits torn and cleft by the storms of many thousand winters. At the hour of sunrise, what a glory kindles along a, uh, the crest of snowy of that snowy rampart. At sunset, the spectacle is again renewed, and a line of prize is seen to burn in the evening sky. Drawing nearer the hills, on a line about 30 miles west of Turin, there opens before one what seems a great mountain portal. This is the entrance of the, uh, to the Waldensian territory. A low hill drawn along in the front serves as a defense against all who might or all who may come with hostile intent, but too frequently happened in times gone by while a stupendous monolith, the Castelluzzo, shoots up to the clouds, stands sentinel at the gates of this renowned region. 
as one approaches La Torre, the Castelluzzo rises higher and higher, but irresistibly fixes the eye by the perfect beauty of its pillar-like form. But to this mountain, a higher interest belongs than any mere symmetry can give it. It is indissolubly linked with martyrdom, or martyr memories and borrows a halo from the achievements of the past. How often in the days of old was the confessor hurled, sheer down its awful steep and dashed on the rocks as its foot, at its foot, excuse me. And there, commingled in one ghastly heap, growing ever the bigger and ghastlier as another and yet another victim was added to it, lay the mangled bodies of pastor and peasant, of mother and child. It was the tragedies connected with this mountain mainly that called forth Milton's well-known sonnet, quote, O venge, O Lord, thy slaughter, saints, whose bones lie scattered on the alpines cold, in thy book record their groans. Who were thy sheep, and in their ancient fold slain by the bloody Piedmontese, that rolled mother with infant down the rocks? Their moans, the veils, redoubled to the hills, and they to heaven. The elegant temple of the Waldenses rise near the foot of the Castelluso. The Waldensian valleys are seven in number. They were more in ancient times, but the limits of the Valdois territory have undergone repeated curtailment, and now only the number we have stated remain, lying between Penarolo on the east and Monte Viso on the west. That pyramidal hill, which forms so prom, uh, prominent an object from every part of the plain of Piedmont, towering as it does above the surrounding mountains and like a horn of silver, cutting the ebon from the firm, firmament. The first three valleys run out somewhat like the spokes of a wheel, the spot on which we stand, the gateway, namely being the nave. The first is Lucerna, or Valley of Light. It runs right out in a grand gorge of some 12 miles in length by about two in width. It wears a carpeting of meadows, which the waters of the police keep ever fresh and bright. A profusion of vines, acetas, and mulberry trees fleck it with their shadows, and a wall of lofty mountains encloses it on either hand. The second is Rora, a valley of dews. It is a vast cup some 50 miles in circumference. It, res it slides luxuriantly, excuse me, uh, luxuriantly clothed with meadow and cornfield, with fruit and forest trees, and its rim forged of craggy and spiky mountains, many of them snow-clad. The third is a, a, a Grona, or the Valley of Groans. Of it, we shall speak more particularly afterwards. Beyond the extremity of the first three valleys are the remaining four, forming, as it were, the rim of the wheel. These are enclosed in their turn by a line of lofty and craggy mountains, which form a wall of defense around the entire territory. Each valley is a fortress, having its own gate of ingress and egress, with its caves and rocks and mighty chestnut trees forming places of retreat and shelter, so that the highest engineering skill 
could not have better adapted each several valley or each several valley to its end. It is not less remarkable that taking all these valleys together, each is to re, uh, each is so related to each that one opens so the other so into the other that they might be said to form one fortress fortress of amazing and matchless strength wholly impregnable in fact all the fortresses of europe though combined would not form a citadel so enormously strong and so dazzlingly magnificent as the mountain dwelling of the Valdois. Quote unquote, the eternal our God, says Legger, quote, having destined this land to be the theater of his marvels and the bulwark of his ark, has by natural means most marvelously fortified it, unquote. The battle begun in one valley could be continued in another and carried round the entire territory. Till at last, the invading foe, overpowered by the rocks, rolled upon him from the mountains or assailed by enemies, which, oh, my cat is <laughs> tickling me. I'm sorry, I had to laugh. <laughs> You silly cat. She's tickling my feet. <laughs> Can't help it. <laughs> okay, sorry. I'm going to start over here. Okay. The battle begun in one valley could be continued in another and carried round the entire territory till at last the invading foe overpowered by the rocks rolled upon him from the mountains or assailed by enemies which would start suddenly out of the midst or issue some unsuspected cave, found retreat impossible and, cut off in detail, left his bones to whiten the mountains. He had to come to subdue. These valleys are lovely and fertile as well as strong. They are watered by numerous torrents, which descend from the snows of the summits. These grassy carpet of their bottom, the, main, uh, the mantling vine and the golden grain of their lower slopes, the chalets that dot their sides sweetly and browed, Amid fruit trees and higher up, the great chestnut forests and the pasture lands, where the herdsmen kept watch over their flocks all through the summer days and the starlit nights. The nodding crags from which the torrent leaps into the light, the rivulet Sieving, uh, singing with quiet gladness in the sh a shady nook, the midst moving grandly among the mountains, now veiling, now revealing their majesty, and the far-off summits tipped with silver to be changed at eve to glimmering gold, make up a great or a picture of blended beauty and grandeur not equaled, perhaps, and certainly not surpassed in any other region of the earth. In the heart of their mountains is situated the most interesting, perhaps, of all their valleys. It was in this retreat, walled round by, quote, hills whose heads touch heaven, unquote, that their barbs or pastors from all their several parishes were wont to meet in annual synod. It was here that the college stood, and it was here that their missionaries were trained, and, after ordination, were sent forth to sow the good seed, 
as opportunity offered in other lands. Yeah, note the word missionaries. Yeah. I always like to change James Aiken Wiley's uh, terminology from missionaries to ministers of the gospel because uh, Michael and I discovered that the missionary term is sending out of Jesuits. And uh, I don't like to think of the uh, forefathers of the gospel being Jesuits. Sorry. Let us visit this valley. We ascend to it by the long, narrow, and winding Agrona. Bright meadows enliven its entrance. The mountain, on the other hand, uh, I'm sorry, the mountains on either hand are clothed with the vine, the mulberry, and the chestnut. And on the valley contracts, and on the valley contracts, it becomes rough with projecting rocks and shady with great trees. A few places farther, and it expands into circul- a circular basin, feathery with birches, musical with falling waters, environed atop by naked crags, fringed with dark pines, while the white peak looks down upon one out of heaven. In little in advance, a little in advance, the valley seems shut by shut in by mountain's wall, drawn right across it and beyond, towering sublimely upward, as seen as assemblage of snow clad Alps, amid which is placed the valley we are in quest of where burned of old the candle of the Waldenses. Some terrible convulsion has rent this mountain from top to bottom, opening a path through it to the narrow valley beyond. We enter the dark chasm and proceed along a narrow ledge in the mountain's side, hung halfway between the torrent, which is heard thundering in the abyss below and the summits which lean over us above. Journeying thus for about two miles, we find the pass beginning to widen, the light to break in, and now we arrive at the gate of Para. Excuse me, Pra, at the gate of Pra. There opens before us a noble circular valley, its grassy bottom watered by torrents, its side dotted with dwellings and clothed with cornfields and pasturages, while a ring of white peaks guards it above. This was the inner sanctuary of the Waldensian temple. The rest of Italy had turned aside to idols, the Waldensian territory alone had been reserved for the worship of the true God. And was it not meet that on its native soil a remnant of the apostolic church of Italy should be maintained, that Rome and all Christendom might have before their eyes a perpetual moment of what they themselves had once been, and a living witness to testify how far they had departed from their first faith. And I think that ends the reading of the chapter. And uh, we move on to the Waldensian missionaries in guise of peddlers. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, how far are we in here, Michael? Do you have a time stamp? I have not uh, interrupted the recordings. I think that we are now one hour, eight minutes, uh, subtracting 40 something minutes, so we are half an hour. Oh, okay. So maybe we should just continue with the mm-hmm. Waldensians, their missions and martyrdoms. 
in their missions. Hmm? Yeah, that's right. I I much prefer to say uh, their ministry of the gospel and martyrdoms. How about that? One would like to hear. Go ahead. Did you want to say something there, Hector? No, no, no. I'm, I agree with you guys. Oh, cool. Just keep going. Okay, will do. Going. I just thought I. I asked. I heard your mic there. <laughs> You're making some okay. noise. I just Sorry. thought maybe you wanted to come in, make a comment. So we'll continue. Um, the wall dances their their ministry of the gospel, or should we just say their continuance of the gospel might be better? Yeah, and the martyrdoms. One would like to have a near view of the barbs or pastors who presided over the school of the early Protestant theology. Uh Uh-oh, there's another term. You know why I don't like theology? Theology is in reference to philosophy. Philosophy is in reference to the third beast, which is Greece. It's a tool of the Grecian beast, and I'm not interested. Protestant teaching that existed here and to know how it fared with evangelical Christianity in the ages that preceded the Reformation. (sighs) I'm sorry, I'm going to start this over. One would like to have a near view of the barbs or pastors who presided over the school of early Protestant teaching that existed here, and to know how it fared with evangelical Christianity in the ages that preceded the Reformation. But the time is remote, and the events are dim. We can but doubtfully glean from a variety of sources the facts necessary to form a picture of this venerable church And even then, the picture is not complete. The teachings of which this was one of the fountainheads was not the clear, well-defined, and comprehensive system which the 16th century gave its. It was only what the faithful men of the Lombard churches had been able to save from the wreck of primitive Christianity. True religion, being a revelation, was from the beginning complete and perfect. Nevertheless, in this, as in every other branch of knowledge, it is only by patient labor that man is able to extricate and arrange all its parts and to come into the full possession of truth. Wow, that's pretty cool. I like the way he's put that together. You guys got any comments on that? Yeah, that was a real <clears throat> quite modern uh, approach also. Yes, so, agreed. Yeah, so that, that does not sound like these uh, old books uh, sometimes sound like old English and word-by-word translation, but it's, it really has a profound... Um, uh, explanation, yeah, I can and can really uh, back that up. Yeah, you know? yeah, you could almost say true religion being a revelation of rebirth, true rebirth, biblical rebirth, was the beginning complete. Well, sorry, was from yeah, the it, beginning complete and perfect. It's like yes. a, it's like a children's game. Uh, it's right. called telephone. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that, that, that the message will be spoiled and spoiled and spoiled when it has been preached oh, to one yes. generation to another. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's why, you know, it, it's really great to have these yeah, historical usually. books. Yeah. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have, I have learned that in English, in English it's called telephone, but maybe it's also Chinese whispers. So it's, it's just <laughs> that, yeah, it's just another explanation for that. Yeah, so right. that for the syndrome that the... The source, the origin of the message will be spoiled and spoiled and spoiled from, yeah, from one messenger to the other. Yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. So, in other words, it's no longer the same message by the time you get to the end of the game. You know, it's 
It's completely distorted. Yeah, just please compare that with all the revis revis revisions sorry, of the Bible. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Standard revision, new American revised Trying version. to modernize the Bible and make it conform to modern times instead of the, the contrary, where you, modern-day listener, conform to ancient times. See, that's really where it's at. I, I, I realize or recognize... Uh, uh, an article in a newspaper I read some weeks ago, just to make it short, and they told me, no, 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 no. They, in the Old Testament, there's a passage that uh, people were, so males, were peeing against the wall, and that, that has to be eradicated, yeah, so that you, you can't write that, it's not uh, politically correct. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, yeah, so that's uh, may, <laughs> maybe a very elusive uh, example for this, also. That's sure. Political uncorrect, what, what we are doing here. Well, yeah, and that's the thing. It's like, you know, we should almost <laughs> have thought about this <laughs> is make a disclaimer before we even start recording anything at all, you know, uh, that, uh, you know, it's entirely, uh, yeah, you know, when you read and study the Bible, you can go many different directions. There's a lot you can do. And uh, there's a lot of people that like to criticize one way or the other. <laughs> and you're not doing it right. Well, that's how it works. Anyway, yeah, true religion, yes, being a revelation was from the beginning complete and perfect. Nevertheless, this is in every other branch of knowledge it is only by patient labor that a man is able to extricate and arrange all its parts and come into the full possession of truth. Yes, the teachings taught in former ages in the peak environed valleys in which we have in the imagination in imagination placed ourselves was drawn from the Bible. The atoning death and justifying righteousness of Christ was its cardinal truth. This, the noble Lycon and other ancient documents abundantly testify. The noble Lycon sets forth with tolerable clearness the doctrine of the Trinity. Oh, did I say Trinity? <laughs> the fall of man, the incarnation of the Son the perpetual authority of the Decalogue as given by God, the need of divine grace in order to do good works, in order to good works, okay? The necessity of holiness, the institution of the ministry, the resurrection of the body, and the eternal bliss of heaven. This creed is, its professors ex exemplified in lives of evangelical virtue, the blamelessness of the Waldenses passed into a proverb so that one more than ordinary, excuse me, the blamelessness of the Waldenses passed into a proverb so that one more than ordinarily exempt from the vices of his time was sure to be suspected of being a Vaudois. If there were regarding the tenets of the Waldenses, the charges which their enemies have preferred against them would set that doubt at rest and make it tolerably certain that they held substantially what was the apostles before their day and the reformers after it taught. The indictment against the Waldenses included a formidable list of quote-unquote heresies. They held that there had been no true pope since the days of Sylvester, that temporal offices and dignities were not meet for preachers of the gospel that the Pope's pardons were a cheat, that purgatory was a fable, that relics were simply rotten bones which had belonged to no one knew who 
that go on pilgrimage serve no end, save to empty one's purse, that flesh might be eaten any day if one's appetite served him, that holy water was not a whit more effectuous than rainwater, and that a prayer in a barn was just as effectual as if offered in a church. They were accused, moreover, of having scoffed at the doctrine of transubstantiation and of spoken, of spoken blasphemously of Rome as the harlot of the apocalypse. There is reason to believe from recent historical researches that the Waldenses possessed the New Testament in the vernacular, the quote-unquote Liguina Romana, or Romanent uh, tongue, was the common language of, the, of Europe of the 8th to the 14th century. It was the language of troubadours and of men of letters in the Dark Ages. Into this tongue, the Romanote, uh, am I pronouncing that? Romount, Ram, Ramanute. Maybe it's also Romain. Romain, thank you. Maybe. Oh thank you, maybe. Thank, that's a much better guess than mine, Romain. This was the first, was the first translation of the whole of the New Testament made so clearly as the 12th century. This fact, Dr. Gilly, has been a great pains to prove in his work, the Rameau version of the Gospel according to John, the sum of what Dr. Gilly, by patient investigation into facts and a great array of historic documents, maintains is that all the books of the New Testament were translated from the Latin Vulgate into the Ramon, that this was the first literal version since the fall of the empire, that it was made in the 12th century and was the first translation available for popular use. There were numerous earlier translations, but only of parts of the Word of God, and many of these were rather paraphrases or digests of Scripture than translations, and moreover, they were so bulky and by consequence so costly as to be utterly beyond the reach of the common people. This remote version was the first complete and literal translation of the New Testament of Holy Scripture. It was made, as Dr. Gilly, by a chain of proofs, shows most probably under the superintendence and at the expense of Peter Waldo of Lyons, not earlier than 1180, and so is older than any complete version in German, French, Ital Italian, Spanish, or English. This version was widely spread in the south of France and in the cities of Lombardy. It was in common use among the Waldenses of Piedmont and was so small part, doubtless, of the testimony borne to truth by these mountaineers to preserve and circulate it. Of the Ramon New Testament, six copies have come down to our day. A copy is preserved at each of the four following places, Lyons, Grenoble, Zurich, Dublin, and two copies are at Paris. These are plain and portable volumes contrasting with those splendid in ponderous folios and the, of the Latin Vulgate, penned in characters of gold and silver, richly illuminated, their bindings decorated with gems, inviting admiration rather than study, and unfitted by their size and splendor for the use of the people. 
the Church of the Alps, in the simplicity of its constitution, may be held to have been a reflection of the Church of the first centuries. The entire territory included in the Waldensian limits was divided into parishes. In each parish was placed a pastor who led his flock to the living waters of the Word of God. He preached. He dispensed the sacraments. He visited the sick and catechized the young. That's the catechism. Okay, so I think just with the two uh, women, you have the righteous woman and you have the the uh, deceitful woman. It's the same thing. You can go either way with this. Uh, you know, Luther had a catechism, did he not? So it's just a way of teaching the young. With him was associated in the government of his congregation a consistory of laymen. The synod met once a year. It was composed of all the pastors with an equal number of laymen, and its most frequent place of meeting was the secluded mountain girded valley at the head of Angrona. Sometimes as many as 150 barbs with the same number of lay members would assemble. We can imagine them seated, it may be on the grassy slopes of the valley, a venerable company of humble, learned, earnest men presided over by a simple moderator, for higher office or authority was known among them. And intermitting their deliberations respecting the affairs of their churches and the condition of their flocks only to offer their prayers and praises to the eternal, while the majestic snow-clad peaks look down upon them from the silent firmament. There needed verily no magnificent fane, no blazonry of mystic rites, to make their assembly august. The youth who sat, excuse me, the youth who here sat at the feet of the more venerable and learned of their barbs used as their textbook the Holy Scriptures. And not only did they study the sacred volume, they were required to commit to memory and be able to accurately recite whole gospels and epistles. This was a necessary accomplishment on the part of public instructors in those ages when printing was unknown and copies of the Word of God were rare. Part of their time was occupied in transcribing the Holy Scriptures or portions of them which may, uh, which they were to distribute when they went forth as ministers of the gospel. By this and by other agencies, the seed of divine word, the divine word, was scattered throughout Europe more widely than is commonly supposed. To this variety of causes contributed, there was then a general impression that the world was to end or soon end. Men thought that they were, that they saw a, the procrastinations of its dissolution in the disorder into which all things had fallen. The pride, luxury, and profligrancy of the clergy led not a few laymen to ask if better and more certain guides were not so to be had. Many of the trabadours were religious men whose lay were sermons, whose lays were sermons, excuse me. The hour of deep and universal slumber had passed. The serf was contending with his seigneur 
for personal freedom, and the city was waging war with the baronial castle for civic and corrupt uh, corporate independence. The New Testament, as we will, uh, as we learn from in, uh, incidental, incidental notices, portions of the old coming at this juncture in a language understood alike in the court as in the camp, in the city as in the rural hamlet, was welcome to many and its truths obtained in wider promulgation than perhaps had taken place since the publication of the Vulgate by Jerome. After passing a certain time in the schools of the Barbs, it was not uncommon for the Waldensian youth to proceed to the seminaries in the great cities of Lombardy or to the Sorbonne at Paris. There they saw other customs which uh, excuse me, were initiated into other studies and had a wider horizon around them than in the seclusion of their native valleys. Many of them became expert dialish, excuse me, dialecticians and often made converts of the rich merchants with whom they traded and the landlords in whose houses they lodged. The priests seldom cared to meet in argument with the Waldensian missionary or the Waldensian minister of the gospel. To maintain the truth in their own mountains was not only object of this people, was not the only object of this people. They felt their relations to the rest of Christendom. They sought to drive back darkness and reconquer the kingdoms which Rome had overwhelmed. They were an evangelistic as well as evangelical church. It was an old law among them that all who took orders in their church should, before being eligible to a home charge, serve three years in the mission field or in the, in the gospel field, yes. The youth on those the youth on whose head the assembled barbs laid their hands saw in prospect, not a rich benefice, but a possible martyrdom. The ocean they did not cross. Their gospel field was the realms that lay outspread at the foot of their own mountains. They went forth two and two, concealing their character under the guise of a secular profession, most commonly that of merchants or peddlers. They carried skills, jewelry, and other articles. Excuse me, they carried silks, jewelry, and other articles at that time not easily purchasable save at distant marts. And they were welcomed as merchants where they would have been spurned as ministers of the gospel. The door of the cottage and of and the portal of the baron's castle stood equally open to them, but their address was mainly shown in vending without money and without price, rarer and more valuable merchandise than the gems and silks which had procured them entrance. They took care to carry with them concealed among their wares or about their persons portions of the word of God, their own transcription commonly, and to this they would draw the attention of the inmates. When they saw a desire to possess it, they would freely make a gift of it where the means to purchase were absent. There was no kingdom of southern and central Europe to which these ministers of the gospel did find their way and they excuse me and where they did not leave 
traces of their visit in the disciples whom they made. On the west, they penetrated into Spain. In southern France, they found congenial flow, or excuse congenial fellow laborers in the Albigenses, by whom the seeds of truth were plentifully scattered over the Dauphine, uh, Dauphine and Languedoc. On the east, descending the Rhine and the Danube, they leavened Germany, Bohemia, and Poland with their doctrines, their track being marked with the edifices for worship and the stakes of martyrdom that arose around their steps. Even the seven-hilled city they feared not to enter, scattering the seed on ungenial soil. If purchase some of it might take root and grow. Their naked feet and coarse woolen garments made them somewhat marked figures in the streets of the city of a city that clothed itself in purple and fine linen. And when their real errand was discovered, as sometimes chanced, the rulers of Christendom took care to further in their own way the springing of the seed by watering it with the blood of the men who had sowed it. Thus did the Bible in those ages, veiling its majesty and its purpose, travel silently through Christendom, entering homes and hearts, and there making its abode. From her lofty seat, Rome looked down with contempt upon the book and its humble bearers. She aimed at bowing the necks of kings, thinking if they were obedient, meaner men would not dare revolt. And so she took little heed of a power which, weak as it seemed, was destined at a future day to break in pieces the fabric of her dominion. Yes, we're speaking of the harlot's dominion, aren't we? By and by, she began to be uneasy and to have a boding of calamity. The penetrating eye of Innocent III detected the quarter whence danger was to arise. He saw in the labors of these humble men the beginning of a movement which, if permitted to go on and gather strength, would one day sweep away all that had all it had taken the toils and intrigues of centuries to achieve. He straightway commenced those terrible crusades which wasted the sowers by watered the seed and help excuse me. He straight away commenced those terrible crusades which wasted the sowers but watered the seed and helped to bring on at its appointed hour the catastrophe which he sought to avert. This disproves the charge of Manichaeism brought against them by their enemies. Sir Samuel Moreland gives the noble Lycon in full in his History of the Churches of the Waldenses. Alix chapter 18 gives a summary of it. The noble Lycon has the following passage, quote, If there be an honest man who desires to love God and fear Jesus Christ, who will neither slander nor swear nor lie nor commit adultery nor kill nor steal nor avenge himself of his enemies, they presently say of such a one, he is a Valdois and worthy of death, unquote. See a list of numerous heresies and blasphemes charged upon the Waldenses by Inquisitor Rainerius, uh, who wrote about the year 1250 and extracted by Alex, chapter 22, 
the remote version of the gospel according to John from MS, uh, manuscript, excuse me, from manuscript pre- uh, preserved in Trinity College, Dublin, and in the Bob, uh, Bibliotheu, uh, <laughs> Michael, can you help me with this one? What does that say? Bibliothèque du Roi. Ah, ah Bibliothèque likely, du Roi. Bibliothèque. Paris. Ah, thank yes. you. Thank you. Uh, library, uh, what is it? Library? Yeah. Yeah, must be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Maybe Bible Library, yeah. In Paris by William Stephen Gilly, D.D., Canon of Durham and Vicar of North, Norham, London, 1848. Uh, Stransky, uh now here we go again. I can't pronounce these. Quoted by the Count. <laughs> yeah, that's a tough one, huh? A put l'enfant concierge de Constance. Mm-hmm. But don't ask me what it means. Mm-hmm. Uh, some right. Co- some uh, council sure. of Constance. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That quote uh, by Count Valerian uh, Krasinski. In his history of the rise, progress, and decline of the Reformation of Poland, Volume 1. Yeah, interesting. Okay, so that's the end of the chapter. So we made it to uh, the next chapter, the Paulicians. So uh, I guess we'll end the reading for today, Michael, in the history of Protestantism and Hector. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Is there any comments you guys got? I always love to listen to the story of the people that have a for, forgotten history. A people that try to leave the, and the best way the man can live in the dark ages where people were so I'll say brainwash so into a dark spiritual um, way of life that these people they try to to go against all the odds even to live in the mountains to be in peace with the people and peace peace with God uh, living in the nature and trying to be the best and try to go and preach the gospel and do all those beautiful things. That probably this uh, part of the history would be a good one for us in these uh, last days to to see as an example. Of course, Jesus Christ is a, our example, but all these people they uh, they they uh, they paved the the way for many of us to to see the men with. Jesus can do much better than just holding to traditions and uh, false ideas. I love I love this uh, history and the way the James Hick and Wiley says everything and writes everything. It's uh, it's very poetic. Yeah, I love it and really thank, good, thank you guys for for taking the time to read in this uh, beautiful book, the history of Protestantism. You're welcome, Hector. Yeah, hoping hoping that uh, we can make it through. We're uh, what only uh, what one percent, maybe two percent into it now. <laughs> I forget what page I'm on here, but uh, I've got the uh, the printed copy in front of me as well. And uh, there will be portions of this reading that we're going to have to struggle through obviously because of uh, the language and um i'm not the most keen on on some of the wording in this book but i try i try to hob through it the best i can but uh it seems there's there's good days and there's better days so we'll uh we'll just take it day by day here and and uh thanks for joining me hector and michael and hope to see everyone next time And uh, God willing, we'll be here. Maranatha. Restricted to its historical signification, Protestantism is purely negative. 
It only defines the attitude taken up at a great historical era by one party in Christendom with reference to another party. But had this been all, Protestantism would have had no history. Had it been purely negative, it would have begun and ended with the men who assembled at the German town in the year already specified. The new world that has come out of it is the proof that at the bottom of this protest was a great principle which it has pleased Providence to fertilize and make the seed of those grand, beneficent, and enduring achievements which have made the past five centuries in many respects the most eventful and wonderful in history. The men who handed in this protest did not wish to create a mere void. If they disowned the creed and threw off the yoke of Rome, it was that they might plant a purer faith and restore the government of a higher law. They replaced the authority of the infallibility with the authority of the Word of God. The long and dismal obscuration of centuries they dispelled, that the twin stars of liberty and knowledge might shine forth, and that conscience being unbound, the intellect might awake from its deep solemnancy and human society renewing its youth might after its halt of a thousand years resume its march towards its high goal we repeat the question whence came this principle and we ask our readers to mark well the answer for it is the keynote to the whole of our vast subject and places us at the very outset at the very springs of that long narration on which we are now entering Protestantism is not solely the outcome of human progress it is no mere principle of perfectibility inherent in humanity and ranking as one of its native powers in virtue of which when society becomes corrupt it can purify itself and when it is arrested in its course by some external force or stops from exhaustion it can recruit its energy and set forward anew on its path it is neither the product of an individual reason nor the result of a joint thought and energies of the species protestantism is a principle which has its origin outside human society. It is a divine graft on the intellectual and moral nature of man, whereby new vitalities and forces are introduced into it, and the human stem yields henceforth a nobler fruit. It is the descent of a heaven-born influence which allies itself with all the instincts and powers of the individual, with all the laws and cravings of society, and which, both quickening the individual and the social being into new life, and directing their efforts to nobler objects, permits the highest development of which humanity is capable, and the fullest possible accomplishment of all its grand ends. In a word, Protestantism is revived Christianity.